Good morning. This is Pastor Mark Driscoll here from Oakdale Free Methodist Church in Jackson, Kentucky. Glad to be here with you for our morning devotions. Uh, missed you yesterday. I just didn't quite get it together. So here we are today, um, carrying on with uh, message number 110 through the Gospel of Luke. And we are at the burial of Jesus Christ. Uh, would you Would you bow with me, please? Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for another day. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, for your strength. Now, Lord, we come to you today um, just simply asking that you'd speak to us through your word, that you'd help us to hear what you have to say, that everyone listening would be able to come away and say, at the very least, today God spoke to me. Lord, I pray every person would be able to say that today. In Jesus' name, amen. In Luke chapter 23, uh, we, we read about the burial of Jesus. You know, the, the great gospel story is two greatest events in all of history. One is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, probably the most painful event in human history. The, the sinless one crucified and, and just rejected by those he came to save. Then on the third day, Christ rose from the dead which is the greatest single event of human history. You put, but, but here's the thing. Uh, you have the greatest tragedy of human history, and you have the greatest victory of human history. But what happens in between? The burial of Jesus. I, I, I often call the burial of Jesus the, the parentheses, uh, the pause in between the pain and the promise, uh, the, the, uh, the hyphen. Uh, you know, it's, it's the quiet place in between uh, the, you know, and so what happens in that place? What happens when uh, you're in a place that uh, you've experienced great pain and there is promise of recovery, but you're somewhere in the middle? What do you do? How do you live? Um, we're going to go into that and what Jesus, what, what happened with Jesus here in his burial. I think this is significant. Verses 50 through 56 of Luke 23. It says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council. He was a good and righteous man who had not consented to the decision and action of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He was going, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went, into, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb cut in stone where no one had yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and Sabbath was beginning. And the women who had come with him returned from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. What a, what a somber, somber day this must have been. Jesus is crucified on Friday afternoon, uh, the sun is beginning to set, meaning that the Sabbath is, uh, is about to begin. Saturday it's going to be the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Um, according to uh, the, the law, you know, you're, you do everything on Friday, the day of preparation, so that you can rest on the Sabbath. And what were they doing here at, the, at these last moments before the Sabbath? You know, Jesus had been accused of breaking the Sabbath every time anybody got healed. They accused him of breaking the Sabbath. Of course, he said, no, I've just showed you how to really live it. But the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And and all Jesus would do was just say, be healed. It's not like he went out and worked for six hours. And so they would just falsely accuse him of Sabbath breaking. And then they accused him of disregarding the law. And here you have his followers who could have easily become bitter uh, they could have been easily uh, become angry, rebellious, and said, you know what, we don't care. We're just going to do whatever we want to do, and, and uh, you know, we're done with these people. But Joseph, being a righteous man, he wanted to see Jesus honored. Now, you know, one of the arguments that, that, uh, that people have against the resurrection of Jesus is that uh, in most of the time in Rome, if you were crucified, you weren't given a burial. Most of the time in Rome, you were just thrown in a pit with all the other crucified people and the animals could eat you. 
And so people would often say, oh, well, Jesus couldn't have been buried because that's what they did. But, of course, archaeologists uh, have discovered uh, lots of graves where people who were buried and had been crucified, you, you could tell clearly they had been crucified. And so there's evidence that that could happen on occasion. Uh, if Joseph had not intervened, uh, there's uh, the, the natural thing would have been for them to just take him off the cross and throw him in a hole. Um, with the other two, and just you know, just get rid of them. Now, part of the part of the shame is not even honoring you in burial. Part of part of crucifixion was even after death. We we're going to disregard you. We're not going to honor your body. We're not going to treat you with respect. We're just going to throw you in a hole. Of course, you could request, and so Joseph of Arimathea, being a member of the San, Sanhedrin, he had a little bit of power, and so he went to Pilate and he prevented this dishonoring of Jesus and had him taken down from the cross. Pilate granted permission, um, and, and he took him down from the cross and put him in his own tomb, uh, a brand new tomb. No one had ever been laid in it, and uh, in other Gospels it says it was Joseph's tomb. And so Joseph honors Jesus, and he observes the Sabbath. You, you don't see any breaking of the Sabbath here. And then the women, they come, and they realize that Joseph has done this, and so it says when they saw where Jesus was buried, they went and prepared ointments because of the other thing that according to law, you were supposed to prepare the body for burial. You were supposed to put spices and ointments and all the things on it and, and all of that and have the body wrapped properly. And, and uh, Joseph made sure it was wrapped properly and buried and they made sure that the ointments and spices were put on. They all wanted to honor him and at the same time, they wanted to keep the law. Um, and so they didn't want to break the law and they observed that and then they they rest. It says the last line. It says on the Sabbath they rested, according to the commandment. And I thought about that. And I thought about all these different things. I thought about how Jesus said, "I didn't come to condemn the law, or to abolish the law, but to fulfill it." And He fulfilled it even in His burial. He fulfilled the law even even after He was dead. The law was fulfilled uh, on His behalf. And uh, the other thing is that, that uh, why would this be important to, to do this according to Sabbath? Well, one thing was that they were Jews and honored the Sabbath. The other reason was to uh, that Jesus had been accused falsely of breaking the Sabbath, and they wanted to make sure that his name was not uh, smeared by, by them breaking the Sabbath or whatever. The other thing is that, that it shows that the Christian movement would later be accused of being antinomian or anti-law. Uh, you know, Paul later on would be uh, beaten because he was accused of destroying the law of Moses, and the apostles were often accused of undermining the law of Moses. Stephen, the first martyr, was killed because they said he was undermining the law of Moses. And yet, here they're showing very clearly, and Luke includes that line about the Sabbath to make sure that future readers would understand that the Christian movement is not anti law of God. The Christian movement is not one that says, well, the law doesn't matter anymore. The Christian movement says that Christ has fulfilled the law, and it's through faith in him that we fulfill the law. <coughs> the true intent of the law, through our obedience to him and our, our faith in him, that we live in, a, in true accordance with the law of God. Uh, the Ten Commandments are, are fulfilled in Christ. He lives in us, and we can walk in obedience and in faith because of that. That's why Jesus said if somebody teaches this and, and practices it, they'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That great obedience is, is part of the Christian faith. We're not an anti-law. We're, we're not, now we recognize we're not saved by the law. You see, there's a difference. Paul wrote and, that you're not saved by the law of Moses, but he didn't say you ignore it. You're just not saved by it. You're not saved. He said, and, and then Paul writes in Romans that what is the fulfillment of the law? Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart. That All the law is wrapped up in that command. Love. And love fulfills the law. And so my point being that uh, they kept the, the law of the Sabbath in order to show that the, the Christian movement honors the law of God and that Jesus was innocent of, of any accusations of breaking the law of God. Now, the other thing that I, they did, they simply wanted to honor him. They loved him, and they wanted to. their hearts were broken, and they wanted to honor him and, and respect him and treat him uh, with the respect he deserves. And so you see them taking tremendous risk 
also because they were they were uh, the a guard was later set at the tomb and you weren't to go anywhere near it and uh, you know uh, Joseph of Arimathea no doubt his reputation took a nose dive with the Sanhedrin when they found out that he and Nicodemus later in Matthew it tells us that Nicodemus helped he or in John he and Nicodemus went together and took the body down and and did all these things and so it's uh, it's interesting that that uh, the position they put themselves in to honor him. And so as you look at this and you reflect on this, here, here's where, I, where I'm, I'm really getting a, a powerful, powerful thought. All of us, on one way or another, live in the pause. In between the, pa- the pain of crucifixion and the promise of resurrection, what did they do? Well, first of all, they remained faithful to God keeping his commandments. Second of all, they did everything they could to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And third, they rested. They rested. They rested in God in that day of uncertainty. And they didn't know, even though Jesus had told them, they weren't understanding, so they didn't realize what was going to happen the next day. They were just in this pause of pain. It's really painful in between, in between the pain and the promise. How many of us are living there today? And what do you do when you live between the pain of the of the past and the promise of tomorrow? What do you do when you're in grief and you've had a sudden loss? And and the grief is, is so unbearable. And, and your heart breaks every time you think of this loved one. What do you do even though you know you have the promise that you will see them again? You have that promise, but right now you've got the pain of their sudden departure. And you're living in the in-between. You're, you're in that grief space. What do you do? What do you do when you... Uh, when your marriage has has fallen apart and you've you're you've been abandoned by your spouse and you're raising the children all alone and you've got the promise that it, that God will take care of you and your children and God will bring you through you've got that promise um, you know and so you you've got that my mother held on to that promise and and you see that but it hasn't been fully fulfilled yet and you've got all the issues that come with, with trying to be a single parent. And it's painful, it's lonely, it's heartbreaking. And But you've got the pain of what happened and the regret of that. And then you've got the promise that one day God's going to make it okay. He's going to make it all right. And, and you've got that. And so you're in the middle of that, right? There are people today living in between the pain and the promise of other things. A job loss, a career, the end of a career. Um, you know, so many different things that people live with that, that uh, you know, they... They're just kind of stuck in the middle, and all they can do is is, is, is is just wait. You know, I really, in another sense, I think all humanity is living in the parentheses. We've got the pain of, of things that have happened uh, in the last few years, and we've got the promise that one day God is going to bring his kingdom about and his power and his love and his strength. I believe we're in a time in our country where we're in that pause. We've, we've been through some rough stuff the last two or three years. We've, we've seen, uh, you know, violence and injustice and pain and division and sickness and all these things. And now we're seeing economic trouble and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and we're, we're kind of like, but we, we just keep praying as God's people. You know, God is going to make it right. God is going to bring about his will and his kingdom. Uh, it's sad to see people deconstructing their faith. They're giving up. They're, they're walking off. In the, in the pause and so sometimes that happens there are people who just give up and I pray that you won't give up in the middle of that because we have the promise but you know what here's the thing what do you do I'm going to give you three things three simple things to do what do you do when you're in between the pain of yesterday and the promise of tomorrow what do you do right now you do three simple things number one you remain faithful to God as, as best you can. I heard a, I have a friend who's a, who preached a message one time when he said, when you, don't, when you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. I've never forgotten that. And uh, you, when you don't know, do what you do know. Joseph knew what he needed to do. The women knew exactly what they needed to do. They didn't know how to fix the future, but they knew, okay, we've got to take care of his body. We've got to do the practical things. You know, there are practical ways to be faithful to God every day. So if I'm in the middle of the pain of the promise, you know what? Do Be faithful to God and don't stop going to church. This is simple stuff. Don't stop spending time with God and the Word of God in prayer. Don't stop sharing your faith. Even if it's in pain right now, you still have a story. You still have a testimony. 
don't stop honoring God with the way you live your lifestyle. Don't, don't stop. Sometimes people will get into pain and they'll almost feel like, well, since I'm struggling, it's okay for me to live in sin now because God understands. You know what? God is telling you to hold on. This is a time to hold on and walk with Him and stay faithful and true to Him. He never gives us permission to quit. He never gives us permission to stop being His children, to stop being who we are. And so we still hang on to who He is and we believe He's holding on to us. The second thing to do is, is seek to honor the Lord Jesus. Remember that Jesus Christ, no matter what my circumstances are, I know He is always worthy of honor. Because no matter what happens to me in this life, nothing can change the fact that the sinless one died on a cross, shed his blood to take the full penalty of my sin on himself. He became sin for me so that I could become the righteousness of God in him. Nothing can change what he did. Nothing can change the fact that he deserves honor with my life. I might be angry sad, broken, miserable, unable to tell what's going on. I might be up to my ears in problems and debts and all kinds of things, but nothing can change the fact that God in heaven came to earth in a human form, died a sinner's death so that I could have eternal life, and then he rose from the dead. Nothing can change that. I may not feel all the feels of it right now. I may not feel all the joy and hope of it at this particular moment. But you know what? Nothing can change. You know, the Bible tells me He loves me. The Bible tells me that God showed His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's all the proof we need of the love of God. All the proof I need is, is, the love, is that He loved me enough to die for me on the cross. You know, the, the cross settles everything. It's through the cross that you have hope. It's through the cross that you can look forward and know that there's a day coming, a resurrection. There's a day coming. Because he was willing to lie in that tomb and be dead. He was willing to, to die so I could live. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. He became sin for me. And so how can I say God doesn't love me because my present circumstances are really painful? I can admit they're painful. I can go through the grief, and there's, it's okay. And going through grief does not mean you're not a Christian. And it doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means you're a human being who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But he's going to comfort you, and he'll walk you through it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. And you just keep going. Walk with him. Trust in him. But live a life that will honor the one who died for you. That's number two. And number three, I think it's crucial. It's the last line in this chapter. It says, On the Sabbath they rested, according to the commandment. You know what? You've got to learn to rest in God. You've got to learn to rest in God. I've got to learn to rest in Him. I've got to learn to say there's a, there comes a point when I have to say, God, there is nothing else I can do but rest in You. I can't figure you out. I can't figure out what happened. You know, when Joseph and the women, they, they, didn't, they couldn't understand what just happened. Their whole world just got blown apart. In just in a matter of hours, their entire world was blown apart. And you know what? But they, they didn't understand. They couldn't put the pieces together. But they rested on the Sabbath. You know what you do during the pause? You rest. There are times when you need to, you need to stop. You need to rest. You need to spend time with the Lord. You need to, to get away and, and, and do something that's re, uh, restorative for your soul. You need to talk to people that you can count on and, and just talk with and cry with and, and, and work through things with. You, and sometimes you just put one foot in front of the other and you just you rest in Him because He is able. He says, come to me, remember, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. You need soul rest today. You need to rest your soul in Him. Sometimes the world wants to hurry up, and when you're going through pain, they want to hurry up and push you through. You know, you go through a divorce, and your best friend wants to fix you up with a new partner, like, you know, within a couple of weeks, and, and you, go, you you lose your job, and you, and you start looking for quick ways to, 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 to become a millionaire, or you jump into all these. It's so easy. Oh, we got to do something. Got to do something. Got to do something. Sometimes the best thing you got to do is rest in God and stop, and just allow God to direct you, allow Him to minister to your heart, 
Allow them to help you process the pain. Allow them to help you work through any of the, any of the things you're going through. And then uh, just and then, then say, God, I'm, I'm going to do what I've got to do. You know, got to take care of the kids. I got to take care of the bills. I got to walk through life. But Lord, I'm resting in you. My confidence is in you. Rest isn't so much what you do with your body as what you do with your soul. Rest is an attitude of the heart. You know, your body may not be able to slow down right now. You might have to stay busy and work. You can still rest while you're busy because it's where your soul is. Rest is soul work. And so I can be working a 40-hour week and still be at rest because I'm, I'm in my spirit, in my soul. I'm placing my confidence, not in what I accomplish. I place my confidence in Him. And I say, even though, Lord, I don't understand what's happening around me right now, even though I totally don't get it, I trust that you've got me in your hands. And I believe by the gospel, I'm living between the pain and the promise. And the promise will surely come. The promise of resurrection will surely come. Uh, ultimately, of course, when you die, and those who die in faith will rise to eternal life. But you know, there are smaller resurrections that happen throughout life. There are those moments of breakthrough that happen throughout life where you've come through the pain, you've been through the difficulty, and then God opens up a door, a door of hope and a door of restoration, and things begin to work out and come together. And you begin to see how it all pulls together. Those days can come. Those days will come. For the one who trusts in Christ, and I have to challenge you, are you trusting in Christ today? Are you trusting in Christ today? Let this crisis lead you to the Christ. Let this place of pain lead you to the promise. Take this moment and say, Lord, I don't understand what's happening here, but I put my faith in you. I put my total trust in you, and I pray that you would uh, deliver me, save me, change me, and make me whole in the middle of this pain. And I commit it all to you. Rest in him today. And he's got you. And he's going to walk with you. And he's going to give you hope and peace. God bless you. Go in peace.